from the world's leading center for finance, the arts, publishing, science, research, media, innovation, and much more. This is Metro Focus with Rafael P. Roman. Tonight, the new front in the war on poverty. There are now more poor residents living in suburbs than in major cities. American Promise, the documentary that will open your eyes to the world of African-American boys and their educational achievement gap. There's a cultural disconnect between independent schools and African-American boys, and the question is why? And looking back on a 30-year career in professional basketball. Yeah, I'm proud of the fact that the sport is probably the most diverse of all enterprises, literally in the country. Funding for this program is made possible by the Ford Foundation, working with visionaries on the front lines of social change worldwide. Corporate funding for Metro Focus is provided by Mutual of America, your retirement company, and by the following. Hello, I'm Rafael P. Roman. Welcome to Metro Focus. In January of 1964, President Lyndon Johnson declared a war on poverty. Fifty years later, when we hear the words war on poverty, we still think of rural and urban images. But even though it's less visible, there's a growing poverty problem in America's suburbs. PBS NewsHour weekend reporter Megan Thompson went to Suffolk County, Long Island, where both public officials and the working poor are struggling to find solutions. Behaving, right? Be nice, ladies. Be nice, ladies. Okay, so do you guys want to do the chocolate chip or the sugar cookies first? By all appearances, Lee Scazzari is living a comfortable suburban life. She baked cookies one recent afternoon with her four-year-old twins at her mom's place in Shirley, Long Island, about 65 miles east of New York City. Okay. Scazzari owns an SUV. Bye. The girls spend their days at a nice daycare center, and Scazzari works a full-time job. A lot of people look at me and they judge me just by looking at me like, okay, well, she has a job, you know, she, you know, she has a home and, uh, you know, her kids look very well taken care of. She, why would she need any help at all? Scazzari needs help because by official standards, she and her daughters live in poverty. Her job as a certified medical assistant pays just over $19,000 a year and offers no benefits. So Scazzari's on Medicaid, gets food stamps, and a government subsidy to pay for childcare she could never otherwise afford. This 30-year-old single mom lives in that two-bedroom house with her mother and pays rent. Her car has almost 200,000 miles on it and is in such bad shape, Scazzari says she's afraid to drive it. I live paycheck to paycheck. That's what it is right now, yeah. Do you have any savings? Typically, I have enough probably to get me through the next week or so, but as far as having a savings, no. I worry about not being able to have enough food to feed the girls. I worry about them not having the opportunities that other kids um, are going to have. So I'm constantly worrying, you know, I'm always worrying. According to experts, stories like Lee Scazzari's are becoming more common across the United States. There are now more poor residents living in suburbs than in major cities. Elizabeth Kneebone is a fellow at the Brookings Institution and co-author of the book Confronting Suburban Poverty in America. Poverty in these kinds of communities can be hidden. Uh, it can be harder to identify um, or, or even understand the extent to which need has grown because it may not be uh, easily visible. Today, the nation's poverty rate is about 15 percent compared to 19 percent in 1964 when President Johnson declared the war on poverty. Our aim is not only to relieve the symptom of poverty, but to cure it. Kneebone says since then, some aspects of the problem have changed dramatically. Well, when we saw the launch of the war on poverty, uh, the geography of poverty was very different than what we're looking at today. The bulk of poor people in the country lived in urban areas, in big cities or in rural communities. And since that time, we've seen a real shift. According to Kneebone, since 2000, the number of poor people living in suburbs has grown by 65 percent. The main explanation for this shift is simply demographics. Many more Americans have moved to suburbs in recent years, and that growth included low-income residents and new immigrants. Other factors? Suburbs are still recovering from the foreclosure and financial crises. Kneebone says federal programs for the poor were mostly designed back in the 60s with rural or urban communities in mind. 
And when hard times came to the suburbs, many were not prepared. Often, suburban communities uh, have not built up the same level of infrastructure uh, and, and safety net supports that cities have been building up over decades. Oh boy. <laughs> Uh, where do I begin with the challenges? Um. Richard Kubek chairs the Welfare to Work Commission in Suffolk County, where Lee Scazzari lives. It advises the county legislature on issues affecting low-income residents. Local governments, already strapped themselves, face greater burdens in the face of federal budget cuts and the winding down of stimulus funds. Suffolk County, in the last couple of years, has faced a $500 million deficit. Even though Suffolk County has one of the highest median household incomes in the country and multi-million dollar homes in the Hamptons, the food stamp caseload has soared up 185 percent in the past six years. In Suffolk County, charities have stepped up as the local governments had a hard time meeting the demand. Okay. Food pantry organizers say they've seen numbers double in recent years, even in some of the county's most affluent towns. Carol Yarmish leads the Mercy House Food Pantry in Dix Hills. We used to be one of a few few food pantries, but now we're one of very many food pantries, and it's multiplying on, on a level that it's hard to comprehend. Advocates say they're not just serving people out of work. They see many with jobs who can't make ends meet, just like Lee Scazzari. We also have these larger shifts in the economy where a lot of the jobs we're creating uh, don't pay enough to make ends meet for a family. Despite our affluence, we have a lot of middle-income people who are struggling. We are one of the most expensive communities in the United States in terms of everything. Gasoline, housing, food. In 2012, Quebec's commission put out a study estimating that because of the high cost of living here, the poverty rate's at least 20 percent. That's three times higher than the official census figure of less than 7 percent. Another major problem and expense is transportation. In many suburbs, public transportation is limited. Until recently, buses in Suffolk County didn't run on Sundays. If you're a working poor person, if you're, for example, a home health aide, many of them work on Sundays, what do you do? How do you get to work? Unless someone drives you, you take a cab, which could eat up 20 to 50 percent of what you're earning that day. The Suffolk County Welfare to Work Commission is trying to address this and other issues affecting the working poor. It's pushed for more child care funding, held hearings to call attention to growing poverty, and helped get some public bus lines running on Sundays and later at night. Experts say it's critical for suburbs across the nation to recognize and address the changing face of poverty. If we think about the war on poverty, 50 years ago, when Lyndon Johnson declared this war. If everybody had known what was going to happen, what would we have done differently? This is our opportunity now for suburbs to answer those questions. And with me now is Megan Thompson of PBS News Hour Weekend. Megan, welcome. Thank you. Now, Megan, this is a moving story, but we know that there's probably some people thinking, if, if times are so tough for Lee, why does she continue to live in a nice house? And, in a high cost of living area. Did you ask her about that? I did ask her that question, and she said quite simply that she doesn't really feel like she has a choice right now. Um, Lee found out that she was pregnant after uh, the father of the twins had left her. So mm. she's a single mom. Um, she's from Long Island. Her mom is the only family that she has. And at this point, living with her mom is actually the affordable option for her. She mm. only pays a few hundred dollars a month um, in rent. Her mom can help babysit. The girls have a backyard. Um, so even though some costs are really high, this is what's making sense for her now. Um, and I, I think your question actually brings up this sort of larger question of what poverty looks like in right. suburbs. Um, yeah, it looks like Lee kind of, you know, is living a nice life. Um, but often, you know, we're not talking about people who were born into poverty or families that have been entrenched for generations. Um, Lee's mom actually inherited this house from her grandmother. This is a family that I would say has been solidly middle class for generations, sure. and that's why they have this house. They live where they live. Um, so, you know, but now we've got Lee who's working full time. She can't make ends meet. She's at that poverty line. She doesn't know how she's going to send her kids to college. Yeah. I think it's a story that's playing out in suburbs across the country, and it's troubling. As we know, there's a debate going on in Washington and elsewhere about whether it should fall on the shoulders of hard press taxpayers to pay for the programs that are helping Lee and people like Lee. Did you talk to her about that? 
I did. I asked her about that, and she said that she understands the backlash, but she says she's been working since she was a teenager, and she feels like she's been paying into the system as much as she's now taking out. And for her, this is only supposed to be temporary. These benefits are keeping her working, um, you know, a productive member of society. And she's actually facing something that we learned about in our reporting called the cliff effect or the earnings cliff. And basically, a lot of these programs have very um, strict earnings limits. So Lee can't earn any more than $19,000 a year. Otherwise, she loses the benefit. So she's actually turned down raises at her job so she can keep this childcare subsidy, so she can keep working. So um, the system's very inflexible, and um, she says she can't wait till this fall when the kids go to kindergarten. She doesn't have to worry anymore about childcare, and she can move up. Well, as we heard in the piece, as recently as two years ago, uh, Suffolk County was facing a half a billion dollar budget deficit. I mean, at times when the, the state and the federal government are in no shape to come in with substantial economic assistance, how does the county really get its arm around this problem? Yeah, I mean, this is obviously a huge problem for Suffolk County and you know localities across the country. I think one issue is changing perceptions. So when it you know it's time to allocate this limited pot of money, it's going to the you know people who really need it. Um, Elizabeth Nebo of the Brookings Institution also talks about how local governments need to start thinking um, about collaborating with local nonprofits and maybe even the private sector, and not just working on this in a local level, but also thinking about it at a, as a much more regional issue. So at Long Island, you know, dealing with this problem, or maybe even the entire metro area. Hmm. Um, she also points out that a lot of these existing federal programs were designed mostly for urban areas or rural areas. So maybe if we take these existing programs, rejigger them so they're a little bit more flexible and more able to address poverty where it is now, that's another way to look at this. All right, Megan, thank you so much. Thank you. Coming up on the PBS series, POV, on February 3rd, is a documentary that follows the 13-year journey of two African-American boys and their families. A journey that began on the day the boys enrolled in the Dalton School, one of New York's most elite and expensive private schools. American Promise was produced and directed by the parents of one of those boys, Dr. Joe Brewster and Michelle Stevenson. And the film raises provocative questions about race, class, and opportunity. To answer some of those questions, Brewster and Stevenson have also written a new book, Promises Kept, Raising Black Boys to Succeed in School and Life. We'll talk to Dr. Brewster in a moment, but first, here's the promotional video for a glimpse of the award-winning two-hour film. Idris, yeah? tell me about your girlfriend. I don't have a girlfriend. <laughs> You're just shy. I'm not shy. I'm shy. <laughs> Idris is extremely bright. Shayon's creativity is exceptional. What we teach at Dalton is to teach them they have a voice. It's my best school and I love it there. I would like to be a professional basketball player when I grow up. I want Shayon to be comfortable around white folks. Because I think even at this point, I am not comfortable around white folks. How do you feel about being one of the few black kids there? Is that ever an issue? No, it's never an issue. Good try, Idris! Dalton will open doors for him for the rest of his life. You see the inauguration? At one point, I was thinking what we're doing could pay off in something like this. Not that I want you to be the president of the United States. I'm not going really good in school. You get really frustrated. My basketball team, they said, oh, you talk like a white boy. They told us that our son is a hard to manage guy. They don't know him. There's a cultural disconnect between independent schools and African-American boys, and the question is why? I hate school. It's bad, it's hard. The problem is focusing on class. After you leave Dalton, where do you go? I really don't want to leave. I don't think it was, frankly, a good match for him. I'd be better off if I was white. Isn't that true? This is unacceptable. Sit up! It's laziness. Something is wrong with my child. People would say, wow, you're controlling his entire life. Well, I think we weren't controlling enough. Dad is not giving up on you. I'm hard because I want you to be a better man than I am. I think I'm ready for college. I can't take life for granted. It feels so right. Just calling my name. There's nothing you can't do in this world. We back you up all the way. 
the Triumph Award goes to Shea Summers. This is just the beginning. Even through all the struggles, I feel like I'm going places. You should be proud. And joining me now is Dr. Joe Brewster, one of the producer-directors of the film and co-author of the new book, Promises Kept. Joe, welcome. No, thank you for, for having us, and thank you for giving us this opportunity. Why did you decide to make this epic documentary? Well, when we started, we didn't think of it as epic. We thought of it as an opportunity to go somewhere where um, filmmakers haven't gone before, the independent school. We thought it was an opportunity to document diversity. So we asked uh, his kindergarten class at the Dalton School to be involved. Uh, five members agreed uh, to go on this journey with us. And over the years, several of the, of the participants uh, dropped out of the film. That left us with boys, both African-American, both from Brooklyn, one our son. And their struggle uh, stirred something in us. You put your son Idris in Dalton with the expectation, and I'm quoting you, that he would bypass racism and achieve his human potential. It didn't quite turn out that way, did it? No, it did not turn out the way we initially envisioned. We, we envisioned him becoming a Rhodes Scholar. We envisioned mm -hmm. him being at the top of his class. But I would say that it turned out okay. And, and I think primarily because we had a better understanding of what diversity does or what it, the potential of diversity. We have a better understanding over time of the, of the obstacles that African-American boys face, which are different from other boys. The audience can see these two boys, Idris and his friend Shayon, go through some really big difficulties culturally and emotionally. And you know people are going to ask, some viewers are going to ask, uh, why did you put them through that? I think we put them th through that because we thought that was the best educational experience for him uh, and, uh, and the uh, support that he had. We did not understand re in reality where we were going. But over time, we began to talk to other parents uh, and we realized uh, that that was a good environment for him. You know, Dalton is not an environment uh, which is unlike other environments. It's not unlike the environment at, at uh, this, this television station mm -hmm. or the local hospitals. Uh, uh, those obstacles, that unlevel playing field is, is ubiquitous in American society. And we thought we had the ability to support him through that. It took some time. But you know, there's a, a concept in, in education. It's called the growth mindset. Uh, what we had to have is a growth mindset, the ability to see him as adaptable and able to learn and able to uh, ad uh, adapt to the, the, these complications. Now, Dalton doesn't always come off well in the documentary, so how were you able to get their permission to shoot there for the whole 14 years? And the permission of the parents uh, of sure. Idris' classmates? Well, we well, you know, this is a complicated documentary. No one comes off well all the time. But I think if you put Dalton uh, against uh, government, uh, local hospitals, other institutions, I, I think they come off uh, uh, looking like they're trying to make a difference with a difficult issue. One of the terms that we use to describe this, this unlevel playing field it has to do with uh, implicit bias. That is unconscious racism unconscious perceptions that we act on without even knowing each other, which ha happened at a, a split second. And so Dalton is at least making attempt to address that. I think if everyone else made the same attempt, uh, what you see is this country would thrive in a way that people have ne never imagined. And, and as you look at the film, it, it appears that diversity within Dalton increased over the, over the 12 years? Well, we, were, we were promised diversity from day one. And again, uh, it took them several years. But you know, their, their incoming class is 50% of, of color. And I think that's a tremendous achievement. Now, you also wrote Promises Kept as a companion to the film. How does the book complement the film? In the documentary, it's a coming of age story, but it's our own personal experience. We raise a lot of issues in the film but the, we don't give answers. 
And in fact, we leave some of the questions ambiguous. In the book, what we try to do is drill down and give people concrete things that they can do to make a difference in the lives of their families and their boys in their community. Give us an example. The more active you are with your child, the more you speak to them, whether they are verbal or not, uh, the more they will succeed academically. Well, Joe, thank you so much, and thank you so much for your wonderful film. Thank you for having us. We know this is the week for talking about football, but professional basketball is still one of sports' big attractions, even if both New York teams are having a less than stellar season this year. But 30 years ago, when David Stern became the commissioner of the NBA, it wasn't such a sure thing that pro basketball would draw audiences and fans. Stern is retiring on February 1st, and he joined longtime New York sportscaster Len Berman recently to look back at his career. 30 years. That's quite a run. Oh, it's been the best job in the world, I really believe. Really? It. I've enjoyed it. I, I actually enjoy it more when I think about it than when I live it, but I know I've had a great job. Despite all the slings and arrows and everyone oh. taking shots. And you know, that's, that's what the job entails. Uh, I'm there to step in front of the shots because the NBA is my client and my, you know, and my brand. Take us back to February of 1984. You're 41 years old. You become commissioner of the NBA. What were you thinking? Uh, I was thinking that this was a great opportunity. This was a tarnished, tarnished situation that really had enormous potential and that the things that people were saying about it uh, were not American and it was going to... What made it tar Why well, was it tarnished? Because uh, people were busy saying that America would not watch a sport that was a majority black. We had just, uh, in 84 or 5, we had like five games on regular TV, regular season TV. Uh, our, our playoffs had been tape delayed just two mm -hmm. years before our finals. Right. Uh, and the only time we got attention was if uh, uh, there was an act of violence or someone did a story on race, and that was sort of it. And that was even after Larry and Magic uh, had joined the NBA. And uh, we worked very hard with our players, with our players' union, with a variety of things to sort of begin to, you know, bring it up to where we thought it had a right to be. And it was great fun. So as you look back over 30 years, what are you most proud of? Um, it's, I, it's really a body of work. I, I don't know what else to say. I'm proud of the fact that uh, the sport is probably at the management level and at the team level, the most diverse of all enterprises, literally in the country. Uh, I'm proud that our players are at the top of the celebrity pyramid many times for the work that they do in their communities and around the world. The last 10 years, our players and legends have visited South Africa. The first time we went was in 93 when we visited with soon to be President Mandela and he told us to come back when it was a democracy and he was president. Uh, I'm very proud of being on the right side of social responsibility and I'm proud of the WNBA, I'm proud of the NBA Development League, I'm proud of our digital efforts, I'm particularly proud of our global efforts. So to paraphrase Sinatra, regrets, did you have a few? Uh, I'd like to have been smarter and better in a lot of different things. It took me too long to finally understand what the ultimate power of sports was. Uh, I know that sounds funny, but but, you know, there are other governments that understand that sports properly understood is about exercise, fitness, and good health. So the power CNN. of sports to educate, to... To educate, to inform, to have conversations. You know, Magic Johnson changed the world's debate on AIDS mm -hmm. when he announced that he was HIV positive. And so we have enormous power. And uh, I think it's incumbent upon us to be judged harshly if we don't use it the right way. So crystal balling, what will the NBA look like in 30 years? Oh my, that's a good one. You and I, will go to a game then and we'll see what it looks like. You're gonna like. go to games? Yeah, of course, of course. I would say that uh, it's not gonna be global in the sense of having franchises any place other than possibly Europe, 
But the reformulation of sports through digital technology is going to be incredible. So other than going to an occasional game with me over the next 30 years, uh, what else are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to do lots of stuff. Stay tuned. Uh, I'm going to be at a small minimum doing some traveling for the NBA I've, internationally because that's, to me, that's a wonderful opportunity for the NBA and a little bit for me. And I'm committed to the continued growth of the NBA. So I'm going to have some fun. And it's going to involve some activity for business, some for ambassadorial purposes, some for social responsibility purposes. I, I'm going to keep doing that. And the other stuff will give me a couple of months and it'll all come into focus. Thank you, Dave. Congratulations. Thank you. It's always been a pleasure, Len. Thank you. Same here. That's it for this edition of Metro Focus. We'd like to know what you think, so visit us on Facebook or online at metrofocus.org anytime and add your comments and questions. And join us again next week for news, conversations, and in-depth reporting from New York and New Jersey Public Television. I'm Rafael Piroman. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Funding for this program was made possible by the Ford Foundation, working with visionaries on the front lines of social change worldwide. Corporate funding for Metro Focus is provided by Mutual of America, your retirement company, and by the following.